Stand with me again, number 150, This World Is Not My Home. This world is not my home, I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't be left for
Amen. If you would stand with me one last time and turn your hymnals to number 182. We're on the Glory Land. I can't talk. Glory Land Way. One day we're going to be touring that city. Number 182. Many times I have wondered about the sights of that city and all that my eyes shall be behold. I will see all the wonders when I enter that city. Therefore, ever to be safe in his fold. Some morning you'll find me touring that city where the Son of God is the light. You'll find me there on the streets so pretty, made of gold so pure and so bright. With Jesus, the one who gave me the victory, who led me. Across the divine, some morning you'll find me touring that city, where with him I will ever abide. Here on earth we have troubles that to us seem so heavy, but in heaven no one will be sad. Mom and dad will be singing, and the praise is what you'll be. I said, look, there's a first time for everything, all right? I couldn't figure out how to put the microphone on. My wife had to mic me up because I didn't know how to do it. You taking pictures of me? Oh, well. Don't applaud him. Don't do that. Andy, I know. That's what I'm afraid of, Miss Louise. It's already broadcasted, so anyway. Well, I want to say thank you uh, for honoring me this morning and the gifts and the kindness with you. I, I appreciate it. And I will wear the shirt with, with gladness and honor. And you got other gifts down there. Thank you. I will forget, so i got to make sure I remember that tonight. Thank you. But thank you to everyone who, who participated that, and I appreciate it, and I'm honored by that. Uh, let's go ahead and get ready for our offering, if we could. Don't forget, next Sunday morning, Brother Matt Stallman, he's a missionary. He's been a missionary in several, he, well, back up. Back up. He's been. A, he's already. He was a missionary. Um, I want to say somewhere in some country in Africa. I'm talking about the, the back jungles of Africa. He and his family almost died numerous times because of disease, but also because of uh, people there trying to kill him. And uh, so he. They were, they were there for a while back. Um, I don't know how long ago. Several years ago, but they had to come off the field because of their health. If they would have stayed much longer, they probably would have died because of their health. Um, but he was so burdened for missionaries going to those people that he started a new ministry that was training. I hope he talks about this. He trains missionaries and young people who are going into missions on how to go to those places and survive. So a survival missionary. I mean, that's the idea. And he, he takes them out for a week or two, and I'm talking about the middle of nowhere, and trains them how to feed themselves, how to set up shelter, how to do self-protection, how to do security, 
all this kind of stuff just so they can survive and get the gospel to people. And, uh, you know, there are places like that still in the world. you know that? And they're becoming more and more. Yeah. And it's not necessarily in the jungles of South America or Southeast Asia or Africa. It's becoming more places in cities and places like that. You go to the Middle East anywhere or some other countries, you better know some things about how to take care of yourself because uh, it is dangerous. It's dangerous. So he, he still has a lot of that going on. So be here for that. I know you'll, you'll look forward to hearing him and all that. would be great. Uh, one praise from this morning. Um, during Children's Church, we had three kids get saved this morning. Isn't that wonderful? And uh, we found out. I'm looking here. She's not here tonight. I don't see her. Miss Bonnie, are you here? No. Well, uh, Miss Bonnie, it was her, one, of her, one of the kids that got saved was her grandson, Brett's, Brett's son. They've been praying for him to get saved. He goes to he goes to school. How old do you think? How do you think? How old do you think Josh is? He's what? Nine years old. I found out this morning he goes to school, and he says, "You know, they tell us at school that we come from some little creature or something like this." And so on. she said, "He said, I know it's not true. I just don't know why." He said, I, "He said I tell kids at school about God. I just don't know how to do it real good." Well, he got saved this morning. I have no doubt that he's going to go to school tomorrow and probably be a little bit better at telling people how to get to heaven. And so I'm thankful for that. And uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to talking with their parents and hopefully seeing them get baptized very soon and uh, do that. So don't ever underestimate the value and the importance of young people getting saved. Don't, I got saved when I was a year younger than him. I was eight years old when I got saved. How many of you got saved before you were 18? Would you raise your hand before you were 18? Whoa, really? That many? Didn't know it was that many. That was almost everybody. Not everybody, but most people. Then you know the importance. You may not have gotten saved out of a lot of mess, but God saved you from a lot of mess. And uh, I'm glad that we can have that going on here. So praise the Lord for that. We're going to receive our offering, and uh, I'll come with the word from, word from the Bible tonight. Brother Charlie, why don't you leave some prayer if you would, sir? Precious Heavenly Father, once again, we do thank Thee that we have a place that we can come and worship You as we see fit. Be there with those who couldn't be here for whatever reason, be with the sick and afflicted, and use this offering for Your honor and Your glory, because we ask it all in Your Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. Tim, I'm just going to stand right here because I have no idea how to connect this to this. So I'm just going to stand here just so you know. Brother Tim Phillips, sorry. <laughs> Brother Tim. Take your Bibles if you would. We're going to go to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. We'll show you a verse that God has used in my life over several years to shape my thinking and shape my life. And we're going to read several verses leading up to it, but then point out one verse and just stay in that one verse for the most part tonight. Ephesians chapter 2. 
As you're finding your place there, let me just run some thoughts by you just for your meditation and thinking before we get to the chapter. Um, our philosophy for life should come out of our theology. Have you ever heard that? If you're in the school of the Bible, you've definitely heard that. Um, our philosophy for how we live should come from our theology. In other words, what we know to be true about God determines what we do with our lives and how we live. There's a road that God wants us to travel on in life. And I believe if you'll discover the high road, as Colossians chapter 3, verses 1, 2, and 3 talk about, and as Ephesians 2, which we'll talk about in a minute, talks about this, this way of living. If you'll find this path in life, this road, I believe it's the road that makes the most of your Christian life. And that's one of my goals when I preach and teach the Word of God, is that people would make the most of their Christian life. Live it, live it out, enjoy it. Let God, the Bible says, work out your own salvation. It doesn't mean work for your salvation. It means just work it out. Do something with it. Yeah. Enjoy it. Enjoy it. And I'm going to show you a little bit of that tonight as we look at this road we want to travel on. But look at chapter 2, verse 1. I hope you'll be patient with me. We're going to read from chapter 1 down through verse, excuse me, not chapter 1. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. And then point out one verse. So let's look at the context of it here. Chapter 2, verse 1. The Bible says, And you hath he quickened, those are Christians, who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and, uh, excuse me, the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. I want you to look at verse 10. We are his workmanship. We are his workmanship. I want you to know part of God's plan for believers is found in two words in verse 10. It says, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Part of God's plan for us is good works. But good works is not the price of salvation, but it is the proof of salvation. In other words, uh, you're not saved as a result of good works, but good works are a result of salvation. James tells us that we prove our faith as being alive and as genuine and as sincere and true because we do good works. Now, don't miss this. Acts chapter 10 verse 38 tells us that Jesus went about doing good. That was, if you could sum up his ministry for three and a half years before he died on the cross, he went around, he healed people, he fed people, he raised the dead, he taught this, he did this, he... He went about doing good. See, well, that's not all he did. Well, he sure didn't go around doing bad. <laughs> Acts 10 38 says he went around doing good. So, as his followers, we should be doing the same thing. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. Right? All right. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, um, if any man be in Christ, he's a what? A new creature. A new creature. The Bible says in verse 10 that we are created in Christ Jesus. You say, 
Pastor, I'm already bored. I know. Because our philosophy must come from our theology, you have to have the foundation of what is being taught theologically to get the right philosophy. In other words, you need to know what this is saying before you just determine what you think about it. Right? You with me? All right. So here we go. Let's, let's dive into it a little bit. We're going to go in and we're going to come out and see what, what it means for us. All right? So stay with me on it. Okay? We are created in Christ Jesus. Question. When did that happen? When we got saved, we were placed in Christ. We were placed in Christ. We were made into a new creature or a new creation. He created us anew in Christ. He did not remake us. He did not clean us up. We're brand new. The only other time that word is found in the New Testament, this exact word with this definition is Romans chapter 1, when he talks about God creating things. So we could say this. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. It's the same idea as all that God did in those six days of creation with the seventh day of rest. All that God did in creation week, that very first week, God did in you in a moment. Amen. Think about the power that's in that moment. Everything changed. It happened when we got saved. So we are com a completely new creation. We're a completely different creation than we were before because old things are dead. Old things are passed away. Passed away means it's died. Behold, all things are become new. When it says here we've been, we are created in Christ Jesus, what he's saying is you are made brand new, a new creation, and now you are suitable for the Holy Spirit to indwell. See, before I got saved, I was dead in my trespasses and sins. The Holy Spirit couldn't live in that. But when he remade me and placed me in Christ, now I'm suitable for the Holy Spirit to live inside of me. Now think about it. The Holy Spirit of God, is he as powerful as God the Father? Some of you don't know, do you? You're just like, yes. 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 Okay, if he's as powerful, the Holy Spirit, if he's as powerful as God the Father, is he as powerful as God the Son? Yes. Okay, good so far. A plus, here we go. Yes. Is he as eternal as God the Father and God the Son? Yes. Stay with me. This is not a trick question. It's a, this is a real thing. Is the Holy Spirit equal to God the Father and God the Son? Yes. He is. Yes. They are co-equal, co-eternal. He is as much God as Jesus or God the Father. God. And we're like, academically, I get that. What's your point? He lives in you. Amen. He lives inside of you. Yeah. Ephesians 3.20, now unto him that is able, him, who is him? Now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above. That's the superlative. Exceeding abundantly above all we ask. Now that's an amazing thing. You can never ask anything too big for our God. Now to him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask. But did you know that's not where God lives? Here's where God lives. Or think. There are some things we don't even know to think about that he's waiting to do. How's he going to do it? According to the power that worketh in us. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You see, the power of God in the Holy Spirit is in me and he's in you. You say, well, now you're sounding like a Pentecostal. Now you're sounding like a, some kind of a weird new age person. Now you're sounding a little bit weird. It's Bible. Amen. I'm supposed to stand back here. I forgot that microphone. <laughs> I'm sorry. If you're online, I apologize. I get, this is too small for me to stay behind. <laughs> 
The Holy Spirit lives inside of you. Now, that's what's inside of me. That's just what's inside of you, not what. That's who's inside of you. But I am a new create. Cre- uh, I'm a new creature, a new creation. I've been created in Christ Jesus. So let's think about the Lord for a second, Lord Jesus. The Bible says in the book of Colossians that the fullness of the Godhead, the fullness, the fullness, all the power, that means all the ability and all the authority, all the, the fullness, he is eternal. He is unchangeable. Talking about the fullness of the Godhead. Every attribute you can think about God. The Godhead. The Godhead is Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The fullness of the Godhead dwells in Jesus Christ bodily. And I, you and I, if we've been saved, have been created in Christ Jesus. So I'm in Christ, the Holy Spirit's inside of me. That means I am full up and surrounded by God. So what's your problem? What is too big for the Lord Jesus Christ that you are in and God, the Holy Spirit inside of you, what is too big for them? That's not even the message, but it'll preach for a little while. (laughs) That's not even, I don't I, I even know where I got this. I mean, it's the Bible, but it's not my notes. <laughs> I know where I got it. It just wasn't in my notes. Sorry, that came out wrong. I know where it's going. We are created in Christ Jesus. Is that what your Bible says, verse 10? Yes. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works. You know what that means? That tells me. Because we are created in Christ Jesus, I have a vital. Vital means if I don't have it, I'm dead. I have a vital connection to Christ. Because my new creation, me being a new creature, my being a new creature, creation, is connected to and inseparable to Christ. Because I'm created in him. Anything that we think we can do without Christ is a flop. Jesus said in John 15, 5, without me, he can do nothing. Nothing. So we have a vital connection to Christ. Without him, we don't have life. Because according to Colossians uh, chapter 3, verse 4, he is our life. We don't have life without him. We don't have existence without him because our creation is connected to him. And we are created unto good works. Good works is just this simple idea. Whatever occupies your time, however you spend your day, whatever you do in the waking hours that you have in your day, those are your works and they are to be good. Pretty simple stuff. Whatever you do, it's good. It's supposed to be good. We're created unto good works. Now, I don't want to get too deep in this. I told my wife I was studying this. I got so distracted going to some different things. But I want to, pull, I want to place a certain emphasis on this and get to it. As we go through our day, we're to be doing good works. That's what Jesus did. He went about doing good. The Bible says that God has before ordained that we should walk in them. The walk in those good works. In other words, this has always been God's plan. It's always been God's plan for Christians to have those good works, be in those good works, walk in those good works, do those good works. And not just that, it also means if he has ordained it, that means, that means he has prepared us for that. To ordain means you are prepared to do this. And um, I don't remember the exact date, May something, I don't remember the exact date, May something in 2006, I was ordained to the gospel ministry. Now, I've been preaching for several years before that, and I had been in ministry for a little while before that, but my pastor in the church ordained me to gospel ministry in May of 2006. 
And they were saying, okay, this is, we're saying you are prepared for gospel ministry. God has ordained us. He has prepared us for good works because he's made us a new creature. So well, I don't have the education. I don't have the experience. You're a new creature. So he has prepared you for it. You are in Christ. So he has prepared you for it. Is this making sense? Yes. You have the Holy Spirit. You have been a new creature, so now you are, you are suitable for the Holy Spirit to live inside of you, and so now you are prepared for that. Why? Here's, here's, what, here's the big question. Why? How are we going to do those words? How do we get that done? It's real simple. I wish I could stay on this one word, but I've I, I got to move on. Look at verse 10 again. For we are his what? I don't want to get sidetracked with this. It's so good. The word workmanship. Oh my goodness. You ready for this? It's the Greek word that we get our English word poem. You're God's poem. I don't like poetry too much. I don't like reading poetry. It's not my thing. But to think that God has pen in hand and he's writing the manuscript of my life. The Bible says that we spend our days as a tale that is told. God is the master craftsman, the master poet, the master artist who is writing my life. He is making my life his poem, his story. Good. We are his poem. We are his masterpiece. We are his work of art. We are his workmanship. You walk into this kitchen, you'll see some beautiful cabinets that are made out of curly maple that Brother Dale Tanner made several years ago. Those cabinets are his workmanship. Right? He made this pulpit too. This is his workmanship. Maybe you, maybe you have some other uh, creative outlet that you're involved in and, and you, maybe you, you like photography, you like painting, or you like drawing, or you like some other thing like that where you're making, creating Forming something, when you get done, you say, that is my masterpiece. God says, you're my masterpiece. Right. You are my poem. You're my workmanship. You are my work of art. Why? It's not because of you. It's because I have created you brand new in Christ Jesus. Amen. You are my workmanship. Your life is his canvas, and he is our master producing his work of art. We are his workmanship, not your own. Uh, I, there are a lot of people that, that say, I'm a, I'm a self-made man. Everything I am, everything I own, everything I've got, I've done myself. No, you haven't. You haven't. God has made that for you. It says that we are his workmanship. It's placed in the sentence to, pl to show us an emphasis. It's not, for we are his workmanship, for we are his workmanship. We belong to him. We are not our own, the Bible tells us. Why know you not that you're not your own? You've been bought with a price. Salvation. Look, I love this. We love verses 8 and 9. I love verses 8 and 9. They're powerful. But you've got to read the chapter. I mean, it starts out in verse 8. For. Well, that means read the verses before it. All right? Just like verse 10. For. Read the verses before it. For by grace are you saved through faith. And we all say, amen. Thank God. I am not saved by my works. Aren't you glad for that? Yeah. We would all be lost sinners on our way to hell. But now I am a saint, a child of God on my way to heaven. Aren't you? Yes, yes. Amen. Now, come on. Yes. You got to convince the devil otherwise, all right? <laughs> <laughs> we are his workmanship. My salvation, your salvation, salvation is not of works. The new birth, salvation, is not of works. Verse 
uh, 8 and 9 is about our salvation. Verse 10 is about our sanctification. And it's not about our works. Look at what I, I'm, I'm holy, holy, holy. I'm, look at all I'm doing and all I, how I look and how I'm doing this and how great this is. And I'm so glad. And all the, I heard a preacher one time, I would call his name and most of you know, who, who, know him personally. I won't say his name though. He, he, I heard him say in person one time. At the time he was the second strongest man in America. Big dude. I heard him say one time, he said, I tell you what, I gave up so much to become a preacher. I was lined up to be in the NFL. I was fast enough, strong enough, good enough. I was going to be drafted in the NFL. I highly doubt he was going to be in the NFL. But he said, I was going to go into professional football, and I was going to be in these strongman competitions, but I gave up so much to be in the ministry. And I thought, you are wrong. Because it's not about us. Our sanctification is not our own doing. He has worked in us, so we are his workmanship. He has created us and shaped us and formed us, and he is conforming us, we're in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, 29, he is conforming us to the image of Jesus Christ, his son. God has put thought into our lives. This work is taking place, and as we yield ourselves to him, by faith, obey him. He is continuing that work. Everything God does is intentional. It has a purpose behind it. And I want you to know that his work is perfect. It's perfect. Not just perfect as in without flaw, but it's complete. It's whole. It's mature. And that's what he's doing in our lives. The Bible says in the Old Testament, he makes all things beautiful in his time. That means his work is perfect. That means his work is beautiful in his timing. And it's just what we need. And we are the result of his working in our lives and being a new creation. I want to tell you this. If there's anything good or beautiful about us, it's Jesus and his working in our lives. Paul said, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. I'm glad we don't have to walk after the flesh. We don't have to. We don't have to. But when we do, it gets ugly real fast. Now, that's the theology. Let's get to the practical part. For we are his workmanship. Think about the words, what they mean. For we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus. Can I just stop and say this? This I didn't have I, so much I want to tell you about this. I, I've just been on cloud nine with this. Created in Christ Jesus also means that we are created in the, how do you say, we should reflect him. We should be like him. Because if we are in him, then when God the Father sees me, he doesn't see me as a sinner. He sees Jesus. Because I'm, my life is hid in God with Christ. He sees Jesus. Everybody with me? Everybody good? So if I'm in Christ, the Holy Spirit lives inside of me, and he has worked and shaped and crafted and worked and created me to be his masterpiece. I should look like Jesus. Yes. Can I say that figuratively? You should look like Jesus. Yes. I should look like him. Now, when that truth that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works and God is before ordained, he has planned it and he has prepared me that we should walk in them. That means to live in them. If that's what is true, and I believe that's what the Bible is teaching, you can study it yourself. If that's the case, don't you think we should, we should accept that truth? It's one thing to know, it's another thing to accept it. Say, so how do I accept it? Real simple. Lord, thank you for making me your workmanship. I am your workmanship. Thank you for that. Thank you for creating me, having created me 
in Christ Jesus unto good works. Lord, thank you for making this plan for my life and thank you for preparing me to do what you want me to do because you have shaped me, you have created me in Christ and I am your masterpiece. Thank you. That doesn't, that's not pride. That's just saying what the Bible says. Lord, thank you for that. When you accept this truth by faith, your life is going to be an accurate reflection of it. It's going to be lived out in your life. People are going to see a difference in you. Do you mind if I pick on you for a second, sweetheart? Not pick on you. It's not a derogatory thing. This morning we had a couple of guests come in. My wife came to me and she said, she grabbed me by her, oh, you got to meet these people. And before she works out, they came from there. And I thought, co-workers, okay. I didn't know that. These were customers that she had helped. And all she did was she talked about God for just a second. And they said, where do you go to church at? Well, my husband's pastor over here. And oh, okay. And they showed up this morning. I should around and talk for a while. You see, when you realize you're God's workmanship, it's going to come out. Yeah. You know why a lot, I'm, I'm going to be nice. You know why a lot of Christians, even in our church, don't have that showing out? Because they have not accepted this as being true for themselves. Sure. I'm not talking about self-help <laughs> stuff. I, I'm, I'm, I'm so much against self-help stuff, it's, it's pathetic. <laughs> but I am for letting, I am for Christ helping me, yeah. not helping myself. I don't want self to be the center of my life. I want Jesus to be the center of my life. Amen. I want to help self. I want to help Jesus to help me. When we accept this by faith in our lives, it'll be a, there'll be an accurate reflection of it in our lives. We're going to live as God's workmanship. And I want you to know it should permeate our lives in every area of our life. It, it'll direct every dollar you spend. It will influence every choice that you make. It'll guide every thought you have. It'll saturate every word that you say. It'll govern your relationships. It'll determine your attitudes. It'll frame your perspective in life when you realize you are his workmanship and you have been created in Christ Jesus. The moment you got saved, it all took place. That'll change the way you see things. Here's how it's changed me. It means that if we're his workmanship, and we are, and we accept that to be true for ourselves, which it is true, it eliminates low-level living. So when I realize I'm a new creature in Christ, because my life, uh, because Christ is my life, and he's the master craftsman in my life, and he's working in my life, and he's... And, and, and making me more like the Lord Jesus Christ, I won't take a low road in my life. Yeah. I mentioned to you before, Brother Dale and I have been talking. I talked to Brother Bill and Brother, Brother Dale and some of our, and our deacons and a couple other people as we're preparing this new auditorium over here, not just repairing it, but trying to update it and make it the best we can. I'm letting those, this, this truth guide me. How do we spend money on this? How do we want to do this? I, I, I'm as cheap as, as anything. Yeah. But, but, <laughs> my family gets all fired up when I say that. But, we walk in a restaurant, Sarah, splitting meals, splitting meals. Four of us, one meal. There we go. <laughs> I want to I be careful with the money, but at the same time, this is going to be a reflection of how we see God yeah. and what we think of God. Yeah. Silly illustration. That means I'm not going to go to Walmart and buy the paint. Amen. <laughs> Mainly because I don't want to put four coats of paint on the wall. <laughs> we'll do two and be done because we're going to get good paint, right? Um, we want to. We want to. We want to try to get the best people working on this that we can. The contractors. I think God has brought the very best people to work on this and they didn't even take a dime of profit for themselves 
You see, when you start living at that level, you realize you are his workmanship, then he starts working and he says, okay, if that's, what you, if that's how you want to honor me, then let me help you do that. We picked up the carpet the other day, and uh, Brother Dale and Brother Kenny and myself, we took our trucks out there and picked it all up, and we were talking about it, and, and uh, this kind of carpet is industrial, commercial grade. It's not the kind you put in your home. I mean, you could, but it's, it won't look right, and it's a very, very, very thin, very tight carpet. Most carpet, unless it's a Berber or something like that, a cut pile carpet, uh, this kind of carpet usually comes in 12 and 14 ounces carpet. That means if you get down on it, you can pull it back and you see the backing of the carpet, 12, 14 ounces. I got the best we could. I got 20 ounce carpet. You can peel that stuff back all day and you won't see the back of it. I mean, unless you flip it over. It's the only way you'll see the back of it. You can't look through it. Why? Because we are his workmanship. And everything we do should show that we are his workmanship. So when the choir sings, Miss Cindy is, I mean, she is ruthless. She's so mean. I'm kidding. See how it works? <laughs> See how it works? She's like, oh. Everybody knows that. Everybody knows it. I'm kidding, Miss Cindy. You have to memorize the words and your part. Why? I mean, only college choirs do that. Only professional choirs do it. Why? Because we are his workmanship. It's already back there, Brother Dale. You realize this thing is held together by tape? <laughs> it is, right there. We have another one back there that's not one straight. It's like, right there. And if you don't hold it just right down here, the battery falls out. <laughs> so, Ray told Brother Dale, we need to get a couple new microphones. Why? Because we're his workmanship. I told somebody the other day, we were going to clean out some things and all this. Uh, I was telling somebody the other day, I think I told Brother Dale and somebody else. I've been a lot of time with Brother Dale recently. That's why I keep calling his name. <laughs> Nearly every day I see this guy somewhere here around the church working and stuff. And other people too. But I was telling somebody, the name of our church, somebody's complaining, I was getting rid of something. They were complaining. And I said, what's the name of our church? He said, Galilean Baptist Church. I said, right, it's not Junk City Baptist Church. <laughs> you know why? Because we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works. We're his workmanship. You see, it affects everything. I'm talking about the church right now. And it's, I've been really praying that God would help me through this as we go through this project and be very wise about it. I sought many people's advice and counsel in the church as far as they have the mind for this kind of thing and trying to get this. But look, we are not to do things halfway. We're not supposed to do things cheap and cut corners and do our second best. I've said before, when it comes to anything in life, you may not be able to fly first class. You may not be able to afford first class, but you can always do first rate. The best you can do is what God deserves. It changed how I do things when I got this in my heart several years ago. Our service to the Lord will be, represent, will be a representation of our view of God. It shows what place he has in our lives. And I'm, I'm try, it's Sunday night. I'm trying to bring it up from just Sunday morning crowd. It's not quite Wednesday night, but it's Sunday night. Look, I'm not talking about just don't commit fornication, don't do drugs. I mean, that, that's like Sunday morning. I'm talking about how we teach a class, how we sing in the choir, how we play an instrument, how we come into the service wearing a t-shirt, right? When we come, how, we, how we represent the Lord. How we, my wife told me, she said, why are you wearing a dress shirt over there? I said, it's already awkward enough. I got to always wear something. She made me take my tie off. Although, if you'll let me wear this every service, I won't wear my tie. And I'd be okay with that. Because we are his workmanship. We are his workmanship. We're created in Christ Jesus. See, I just don't know if I can do it. Well, let me show you one more word and I'll be done. Verse 10. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God, <clears throat> excuse me, which God hath before ordained. Remember, that means he's planned it and he's prepared us that we should walk. 
in them. That's them as those good works. Go back to verse 2 in the same chapter. The Bible says, where in time past, that is before you got saved, before you were a new creature in Christ, you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. But then it says in verse 10, God is before ordained that we should walk in these good works. Before we were saved, we were walking, according to verse 2, according to the philosophies, the course, the way of this world, and we were, we were living according to the prince of the power. Of the, who's the prince of the power of the air? Satan. You know what that means? We were children of Satan before we got saved. You say, well, I wasn't that bad. That's not the point. That's not the point. The fact is, we were slaves to our sin. My sin nature was my master. But then when God took me out of that and placed me in Christ, and he didn't just clean me up, he made me a new creature in Christ. And he created me in Christ Jesus, and I became his workmanship, his masterpiece, his beautiful poem and story of my life. He prepared me that I am to walk, I am to live consistently, constantly in those. God is not going to tell you to walk in it and live in it unless he's prepared you and empowered you to do it. Do you believe that? Yes. Yes. My Bible says that he ordained that we should walk in them. Walking is not this. I've shown you before, but don't miss it. Every time you, I want you to see this every time you read the Bible. That's how I see it. Walking is not this. Now, if you have a baby and they did that for the first time, you'd say that was the day they walked. Actually, the day that's the day they took their first step and then fell on their face. <laughs> Unless you're there to catch them. Right? Walking is repeated steps. And walk, and we should walk in them. The tense of that verb is this. You just never stop. It's every day, continually going. And go, I'm walking. I'm workmanship. I'm God's workmanship. I'm creating Christ Jesus. I'm walking in the good works that he's prepared me for. And that's how I live my life because I am his poem, his masterpiece, his work of art, his workmanship. It'll change everything. We don't walk the same path that we used to. We don't live the same way after we're placed in Christ because, see, the Bible says before we were dead in our trespasses and sins. Now we are alive unto God. Now I am dead to my sins and I'm alive to God. That means you're going to live differently. See, well, I tried, then you're going to fail. It's just, Lord, I know that that's for me. I accept that. Thank you for putting me in Christ. Thank you for letting me be filled with the Spirit. Thank you that I am your new creation and I am your masterpiece. I'm your workmanship. Thank you for that. And it changes the way you live. It's that simple. We've complicated. The Christian life, we've, we've complicated. It's actually very simple. We complicate it. We do where is workmanship. Let's bow ahead and close your eyes for just a second. Why don't you close your eyes and bow your heads for just a second. I want you to calm your heart. I know, put your Bible away, but don't, don't think too much about after the service. We're going to be done in just a minute, I promise. But I will, I will give you three things with just privately there in your heart. I want you to think about this. Some of this I'd like for you to respond if you would. With their heads bowed and their eyes closed. How many of you tonight would say that I realize this truth and I accept by faith that I'm a new creation in Christ. I've been placed in Christ at salvation. I accept that and that's true for me. I know that and I believe that. If that's you, would you be able to lift your hand in the air? Thank you. Would you tonight Accept by faith the truth that you are God's workmanship. You're his poem. You're his masterpiece. You're his workmanship. 
his craftsmanship. Would you accept that by faith tonight, that that is what you are in Christ? Because that's what the Bible says you are. Would you do that if that's you? Would you lift your hand in the air? Now, that's just simple truth. Now, you lower your hands. Thank you. If you raise your hand on that one, I don't do it if you didn't raise your hand on this because it won't matter to you. But if you raise your hand on that, you can accept that by faith as truth. How many of you tonight would say, I don't care if I've got one day, one hour, or a hundred years ahead of me. It doesn't matter how long I've got. From this point forward, and, I, and many of you have, this is the way you've lived your life. But sometimes it's just good to make sure that we examine this. You know the great temptation when we realize that we are a, we spend our story we spend our days as a tale that is told. We often want to take the pen and put it in our hand, and we write our story. This is what I'm going to do after high school, and this is what I'm going to do after college, and this is who I'm going to marry, and this is what I'm going to serve the Lord with, and this is my plan for my life. I don't care what. Well, your story is going to be a flop. That's a Greek word for train wreck. Put the pen back in God's hand. Would you, if you say, I accept the fact and the truth that I'm God's workmanship, how many tonight, if that's you, would say, I also choose tonight to let him write the manuscript of my life? Would you let God do that? If that's you, if you would do that, would you raise your hand tonight? I want God to write my story. I want God to write my manuscript. Thank you. Let's get down nitty gritty. If you're his workmanship, then everything in your life is to be a manifestation of that truth. It should reflect that truth. There should be nothing in our lives that contradict his workmanship. If you walked in that kitchen... You know, over here in, the, in, here in the fellowship hall. And Brother Dale saw you take a, a gallon of, of paint. And you open up the can, and he sees you get ready to throw that gallon of paint on those cabinets. You're going to see a man tackle you. <laughs> because that's his workmanship. You don't mess with it. I wonder what God, when he sees our lives, he says, you are my workmanship, but this is in your life and it's contradicting who you are. You're my workmanship. That's who you are. You are my workmanship and you're, this is what you, you have this plan for your life and this is how you're living. This is what's in, you've let this in your life and it's contradicting, it's contrary to my work in your life. I don't think God's going to tackle you. But I think that we're living contradictory to God's will. So let's get down to the nitty gritty. Oh, it's all been happy and good. and Hopefully you've learned something tonight. I pray you have. I've learned some stuff setting it. But how many of you tonight would say, I think there's something in my life that's contradictory to the truth that I am his workmanship. The Holy Spirit showed me something in my life that is contrary. It's not what God would want to be in my life, and it works against what he's doing in my life. And I want God to help me to live beyond that, move past that, and to remove that from my life and, and help me to realize I'm his workmanship. I don't want that in my life anymore, but there's something there. And God showed you that tonight. With no one looking around. Would you be able to lift your hand in the air and let me pray for you? They would say there's something in my life right now that's contradictory to me being God's workmanship. Anybody like that at all? Thank you. Thank you. Who else? Thank you. Don't be ashamed of it. Remember this morning I said if you're going to face some things you have to see things for in the reality the way they really are oh, we get so 
professional church people, don't we? My goodness, we're professional churchgoers. And we never grow. We never mature. Because we're afraid of what people may think. Our, our sinful pride keeps us from all that God has for us. Who else would say tonight, there's something in my life that's contradictory to his work in my life? Who else? Let me pray for you. Thank you. Who else? Let's take just a moment to pray. <clears throat> Let's ask God to, if he, if he needs to show you something in your life that's contradictory to his workmanship, let him show you. Say, what do I do with it? If he shows it to me, what do I do? Well, you can try to ignore it. It's still going to be there. You can try to get rid of it yourself, and it's still going to be there. Or you can say, according to the book of Galatians, the thing is chapter 6, you can bring it to the cross of Christ and nail that to the cross and say, it is crucified to me. If Jesus Christ died in my place for my sins, he died on the cross, he became sin for us, he took my sin, the Bible says, and nailed it to his cross. When there's something that comes up that's contrary to what he wants to be in my life, then I bring it to the cross and say, it's, I'm going to nail it to the cross. Lord, you, you died for this, and now I'm, I want to be crucified to this. It is dead to me. You are my life, not that. You are my life, not that, not that sin. Heavenly Father, tonight we bring these things to you. I thank you for the truths. That we are your workmanship. We have been created brand new in Christ Jesus. Unto good works. You have planned and prepared. You have before ordained that we should walk in those good works. But Lord, help us realize that because we are your workmanship, everything we do should reflect that. There should be no low-level living and just scraping by by the skin of our teeth and, and, and just getting by. But, Lord, there, we should be making the most of our Christian lives, not just doing the bare minimum and comparing ourselves to some reprobate lost goat out in the world that doesn't even know you. Lord, we should be living the Christian life and allow you to live that through us and be like you. So, Lord, may we grab hold of this truth. And may it permeate every area of our lives. Lord, thank you for the truth. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this dear church family. Lord, I thank you again for the three that were saved this morning. I pray you'd help as we follow up with them, that we would see them growing in you. And just as children, that we would see them discipled and baptized and growing in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, give us a good week. Bless our people as we leave from here. I pray that you'd help them at work this week. Guide them. May they be yielded to you and may they have your power and filling the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here tonight.